Here's my gamble. 2020 marks the end of the long 20th century and the start of the long 21st. I'll double down. The Covidian, as a period of the Anthropocene, will signal the advent of post-Western culture. A caveat, while the nascent culture will eventually take on distinguishing features, we are not there yet. By that token, there's no reason why the unprecedented opening movement of our New World Symphony should not reverberate with more familiar undernotes. With proper care, Baroque might be affixed as fruitfully to hyper as classical once was to neo. My hope is to treat historical morphology as one would a Baroque string instrument, grafting and lengthening its neck for use in the contemporary orchestra. My name is Monica Bellavin, and I am a design historian, which makes me by default an over-specialized historian of culture. You may have caught my husband Alonso Toledo's presentation on her occupancy manifesto already. If you have not, I recommend you do, so you can draw further connections along the different lines of inquiry we are pursuing. Covidian Aesthetics was born on March 15, 2020, four days into my quarantine, the first 96 hours of which were spent in utter and unutterable aesthetic absorption. At some point during that period, I somehow found it in me to semi-automatically crank out a text titled Morphology of the Culture Instinct, the first in now six installations on and around cultural changes, resonances, and responses to COVID. I began to track these as one would the movements of a wild animal by tagging its patterns and rhythms at different levels of organization, from the pre-individual to the agrigoric, with more than 3,500 posts to date under the hashtag Culture Instinct, all of which I have sequentially archived online, I have been taking stock of landmark moments, personages, narratives, and shifts in narrative, recurring imagery, intuitions, tropes, and trends during the days the earth stood as still as a landmine and after it was activated like when too. To do so, I keep an eye on mainstream media, I like to dissolve the narratives and bleach their bones, but I lean mostly on my Twitter timeline, where I follow and am followed by thousands of individuals of every political and philosophical persuasion as a toggling device between worlds, points of view, and persona. I have long been interested in the expressive constraints, magnifying capacities, and explosions in scale afforded to writers by social media, and Twitter at its best can be deployed as a connective tissue building apparatus in which you yourselves and I can constitute a thought form that is able to add members as responsively as it sheds cells. To quote Cesar Aida's Cesar Aida in the literary conference, hyperactivity has become my brain's normal way of being. Everything races forward, savagely being pushed from behind by what keeps coming through that accursed valve. This image, brought to its peak of maturation in my vertiginous reflections, revealed to me the path to the solution, which I forcefully put into practice whenever I have time and feel like it. The solution is none other than the greatly used, by me, flight forward, since turning back is off limits, forward to the bitter end. I'm nonetheless aware that trying to theorize current events is also flying forward into history by the seat of one's pants at a speed so extreme as to sometimes feel static. In the face of such gripping immediacy, the difficulty, even the impossibility of handling the present historically is patent. This is why philosophers were fast, maybe too fast, to jump their guns on the pandemic and less astute politicians who thrive on the tried and untrue, too short-sighted to load theirs in time. To venture anything along a history of the short now would amount to no more than collected reportage, being fragmentary, inconclusive, observational, underdetermined, and rushed, and contribute to a climate of mistrust if not framed carefully. Against that grain, Insightful testaments of life during COVID will make the delights of future historians. And there is no doubt in my mind 
that the Samuel Pepises and the Anne Franks of our age are at work among us. My own record keeping is a modest but exhaustive effort to conduct virtual fieldwork and smoke out the imminent contours of what lies ahead in the midst of inordinate environmental and personal noise. I'm not down to separating the wheat from the chaff yet, much less feeding it to constellating software that could help me spot patterns less obvious to the naked mind. And the naked mind is what mine is as I present this lecture to you from exile and without the backbone of my library. I've little more indeed to build this argument than my own notes and observations made over the past few months, remembered readings, a handful of online essays by and conversations with a few others, and a secondhand copy of the University of Minnesota's translation of Jose Antonio Maraval's Culture of the Baroque, which I should add, would be my desert island pick on the topic anyway. God tempers the wind to the shorn land. Now, though I hedge closely to Maraval's historiographical approach, a student does no honor to a master through imitation. Maraval did not force that disservice on his teacher, Américo Castro, and nor will I on him. This is why, unlike Maraval, I will be using Baroque to designate morphological concepts repeatable in culture that are chronologically and geographically disparate because they establish generalizations that might help us ecolocate in the face of seeming civilizational collapse. The global upheaval we are experiencing may be epochal in magnitude, but our moment situates developments within it at different stages of pupation and eclosion, no dry wings in sight. The only finished forms are those being left behind. So if morphology alone may not define a culture, and historical analysis requires data and a distance we do not yet have, what is to be done? I have an intuition. Because COVID is a deep disease that speaks loudly to both our failures and our failings as societies, it should favor aesthetics like no epidemic since AIDS. This was clearly impressed upon me when during early quarantine, I developed an intense anxiety of liquefaction that resulted in some early writing on the tragic and the pharmacon, its actor, as an aesthetics of sacrifice through social forces, and the panic and the prosopon, its reenactor, as an aesthetics of alien invasion. At the razor's edge, of civilization and culture, a bitter privilege, it dawned on me that tragedy was to the city and the theater, to the commons, what panic was to the wilderness and the imminent body, the uniquely uncommon. The first is enacted through social distancing and expulsion, the other through unboundedness, immersion, and self-absorption unto unself-possession. Tragedy delivers us outside city walls to the grave of Polynices. Panic renders us into the unknown. In tandem, they play out the tensions between belonging and intimacy. To trespass against the polis is at least impertinence, at worst, transgression of the norm, while panic is inextricably linked to violations that attack identity and rootedness in form. With barely months of hindsight, is it any wonder people have fallen in step with egregores like QAnon and Black Lives Matters? This is as good a time as any to make clear that my aesthetics are not invested in the pursuit of beauty, but on detecting and recording the interactions between imminent sensations as they take place at the individual and pre-individual levels, and their perceptual manipulation by post-individual hypermemes or egregores, expressed as mobs, the state, internet cliques, the media, or corporations, among others. These simultaneously seductive and deceptive power dynamics are quintessentially Baroque, and the main focus of my interest. To serve it neatly, Baroque culture is put into operation to effect the transition from a discursive economy based on rhetoric to one based on history.
as I will argue, this is where we are. When on April 11, I published some notes on the Baroque as part four of Covidian Aesthetics, a friend sent me a piece by Lorraine Darston, director at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, published the day before. It explained how, for the early moderns, figuring out what a phenomenon was, how best to study it, why it happened, when and where it did, and above all, what to do with it or about it, none of these basic questions had an agreed upon answer because there was no settled script for how to go about knowing. She called this epistemic unscriptedness zero degree empiricism. Dr. Darston also went to some length to make it clear her analogy to the Baroque was obviously exaggerated. Unlike our predecessors, we are the heirs, not only to knowledge, what a virus is, what it does, and how to thwart it, but also to a diverse repertoire of ways of knowing. But history has borne things out beyond what eminently reasonable people might have reasonably expected, because the spirit of the moment is Baroque and has its own internal logic. Four months later, the pandemic is not remotely under control anywhere but in a handful of countries most of them island states. As Darson wrote, when faced with radical novelty and the radical uncertainty novelty emits, we are temporarily thrown back into a state of ground zero empiricism, chance observations, apparent correlations, and anecdotes that would ordinarily barely merit attention, have the internet buzzing with speculations among physicians, virologists, epidemiologists, microbiologists, and the interested lay public. The rational expectation was we would be temporarily stunned by the turn of events and then react sensibly, as if mankind had progressed or morale would improve. But actual conditions were a crisis economy, monetary upheavals, credit insecurity, economic wars, the strengthening of seigneurial landholding and the growing impoverishment of the masses, which fostered a feeling of being threatened and of instability in one's personal and social life, a feeling that is held in control by the imposing forces of repression that underlie the dramatic gesticulation of the Baroque human being and permit us the use of such a name. Those are Maraval's words from 45 years ago, not mine or yours, but they could be because they are so representative of our reality. The only way in which the circumstances Maraval describes have fundamentally changed is in how they've grown. While I can wholly sympathize and perfectly imagine the frustration and befuddlement that Dr. Darston may be feeling now, I had begun to grapple with the probabilities of this turning out more or less the way it has so far a little earlier. My first notes, published in March, were on revelation as bedrock Covidian aesthetic, enveloping the tragic and the panic, but arising also from what people have been suffering privately for months. Those who've been through it will know it, but many of us lost friends and family to COVID even if not to the disease directly, and there was no room to tend to this enormous sense of grief and disappointment and unease. We were left to move on and rebuild our lives and love with only those who had, as it were, survived the great filter of consciousness by seeing it. And this was extremely present to me at the time of writing. Revelation is a reset, irreversible, and a reversal, all at once, the sort of impossible shape hyper-baroque favors. A delimited inversion is a Saturnalia, a complete inversion, a degloving, and that is without question what people underwent during the early months of the pandemic, knowing who everyone was, where everyone stood, how blinkered or sheltered, how selfish or murder-suicidal our dearest and nearest could be, when barely pushed. We may have had suspicions about some of them, but now we knew. This dreadful confirmation extended from the interpersonal to the epochal, 
with one of its leading symptoms being the innumerable examples of transvaluation we have seen in recent months. As individuals and as groups of individuals, we slowly found we knew, we really knew, who we were standing with and among, but not quite where we were or how we should comport ourselves in this new landscape. Coming to terms with this disorienting parallel reality was both mind shattering and world destroying. And this was before the protests. In an unpublished article called A Matter of Truth or Death, my husband Alonzo explains how the US reached zero degree empiricism between June 9 and 14, with the rest of the West following suit shortly after. Though it's a week that will one day inform entire theses, to date, it remains oddly unremarked upon by even foreign media, despite defining the role that scientific expertise will play in future crisis management. The George Floyd protests began on May 26 against almost every health precaution recommended by the CDC since March, organized crowds marched out onto the streets to protest police brutality, giving a final blow to the United States' already tenuous quarantine. The media, however, systematically refused to point out and eventually underplayed the propagation risks involved. Predictably, the Democrats did not hesitate to support the protests, nor did the Republicans miss the chance to avail themselves of the opportunity to validate their antipathy towards masks. Most tellingly though, the scientific community quickly capitulated to the pandemic within a pandemic discourse, with specialists legitimizing the importance of combating racism on the streets despite the public health crisis. Notably, the number of infections 20 days after the beginning of the protests did not increase, with COVID-19 having an incubation period of up to a fortnight. It was expected that by June 9, the infection curve would spike. According to the New York Times, between June 9 and 14, the number of infections in the US grew by only 1.75%, while the number of deaths kept declining and testing increased. This invited Alonzo's speculation around two scenarios. The first was a viral resurgence, no matter how late, by accounting for hospitalizations and mortality as lagging indicators. In this scenario, protesting, even when masked, would not impede contagion, with doubly tragic results since BLM fights for the lives of one of the demographics most affected by coronavirus. The second scenario pointed to the opposite, namely that despite breaking quarantine, the virus had not had the expected effects for any number of reasons. As heartening as this conclusion might have seemed, it invoked the fearsome corollary that scientific opinion was not well formulated and that it preferred to topple the economy through an excess of caution. More insidiously, it lent wings to the belief that a just cause marks the limit of scientific authority. This last scenario threatened tenebrous political consequences. Trump wouldn't hesitate to revisit his baseless declarations to the effect that the virus would vanish on its own, emerging as a prophet who knows better than science. Dr. Fauci would fall on the sword of having sacrificed the American economy for no good reason, abusing his sway over a well-meaning president, Trump could be feasibly reelected. But the main casualty of this domino effect would be the other great crusade that depends thoroughly on scientific credibility, climate change. With a second Trump term and a scientifically mistrustful population, it would be unlikely for the US to adhere, much less lead, the sort of efforts addressing the, the crisis requires. Being aware of this risk, though unwilling or unable to pronounce themselves on it. The New York Times published an alternative metric to mortality in order to display the virus's growth on June 10, a comparative infographic of current mortality in certain cities vis-a-vis -vis mortality at other points in history. Mortality in Lima, Peru is now 3.99 times greater than usual, 
which is greater than the increase of 3.97 New York experienced during the flu epidemic of 1918. Science is a tool and cannot help but be manhandled. If the rate of infections will not tow the editorial line, then a metric that does will be found. It hurts to say it, but we will. It is sadly fortunate that as of June 15, the rate of infections in the US began to rise again. As terrible as an unbridled pandemic is, Alonzo wrote his piece in the conviction that the opposite would have entailed yet more catastrophic consequences in the long term. Two things became rapidly apparent to us in June. Anything that could be used by the powers that be and their adversaries to advance their political endgames would. The culture war is not one of ideas, but one of perception. However, this Baroque manipulation, which has only been called out as such by the very brave or by the fairly safe, also breathed into me something rather like heuristic hope. To quote Dr. Darston, it is at moments of extreme uncertainty, scientific and otherwise, that observation, usually treated as the poor relation of experiment and statistics in science, comes into its own. And it was at the intersection of optics and observation that things came into perspective for me. What Baroque forms have in common is not their floridness, but their extremity. Whether through hyperboles or lightotes, wild exaggerations or severe understatement, aphoristic clarity or antiphrastic irony, the Baroque is all about wave amplitude. It is in this spirit that I would like to frame hyper-Baroque within a new historical emergentism by tying two extreme historiographies together. The first is the history of mentalities, which I established upon introducing Maraval, and which is a persuasion in the history of ideas that concerns itself with how people live, think, and form mental representations of their own living conditions, how people live their historicity, not as a set of momentous decisions, but as the framework of lived experience. In a refreshing take featured in The Changing Face of History, their foreword to Maraval's book, Wat Gosic and Nicolas Spadaccini appoint Wizinga's 1919 waning of the Middle Ages as this microhistorical prime meridian, thus broadening its palette by not summarily collapsing it into and having it eventually subsumed by the history of Anal. It would also make the earliest history of mentalities and volume one of The Decline of the West contemporary. But before proceeding with that, I'd like to remind listeners that the Baroque, like the West, is a modern concept, coined in the 18th century and turned into a counterpoint for the Renaissance during the 19th by the likes of Jakob Burckhardt, Heinrich Wolflin, and the Basel School of Philology, the supreme achievement of which was inventing a complete historic sensibility. I bring this up for two reasons. The first is, it helps to recall that at their theoretical inception, the Renaissance and the Baroque were beta versions of modernity and themselves expressions of romanticized epistemology. The other is to establish the lineage leading to Nietzsche from Goethe, the masters of optics who served as cornerstones to Spengler, the most visible exponent of what we'll be calling morphological historiography. Spengler thought of history as an evolutionary hyperspiral of aliveness developed across social entities, nine grand egregores known as kulturen, the most recent of which is our own which I should add, he predicted would prolapse into Caesarism sometime around the year 2000. Every culture has a complete life arc, the terminal phase of which is known as civilization. On this scale, mankind is no more than the gut floor of history, an aspect, a figment of the greater culture. As popular as the decline of the West was at the time of its publishing, it gained little traction among professional historians, with notable exceptions. 
and the posterity-killing attention of unpalatable characters, from Hitler to Nixon. But the enduring mass appeal of morphological approaches to history seems eloquent to me. In having something of the epic to them, they clearly speak to people on a level that they can respond to. Morphological historiography is also undergoing a discreet comeback of sorts in the discussions surrounding burgeoning civilization states, being ushered in not only by internationalists, but also by world leaders from Macron to Erdogan, as laid out in a recent article by Aris Rusinos. So while this narrative has yet to really hit the mainstream, it is already shaping power. Though the micro and macro historical approaches seem aggressively disparate, that determination should be made in full knowledge of what it is I intend to do with them. My hope as I continue to develop my work on Covidian aesthetics in general, and on the hyper-baroque specifically, is to locate them at extremes of the same optical spectrum in order to use each as one would two of the signature Baroque prostheses, the compound microscope and the refracting telescope. It is possible that though Galileo Galilei, who knew a good idea when he saw one, invented neither, he picked up both on early notice and retooled them. And nor would he have used a microscope for his more telescopic needs or vice versa. The point is only to have every world distending or contracting instrument one needs at hand. Without further ado, I would like to leave you for a minute with the following comparative and totally idiosyncratic charts. On the one hand, we have microscopic history, the scale of which is microhistory, as total history with a small h, subject, mentalities, scope, local historical complexes, the avatars, Johannes Wisinga, Anal, José Antonio Maraval, the origin, the waning of the Middle Ages, 1919, and the technique, which I adopt from the instrument, reconstruction. Then we have telescopic history, the scale of which is macro history or total history with a capital H, the subject, culture and civilization, and egregores, the scope, world historical processes, the avatars, Oswald Spengler, Arnold Toynbee, Samuel Huntington, origin, the decline of the West, volume one, 1918, technique recursion. With this in view, I can produce some interesting elective affinities between them. They share the wish to create or account for some sort of total history, whether it be a precise historical moment or history itself. The avoidance or complication of historical determinism, as opposed to, for example, dialectical materialist narratives an interest in animating the skeleton of basic analysis by studying history as lifelike or life form. A tolerance for the concept of Weltanschauung, conceptions of a long durée. And while I will not develop these points on this occasion, they are worth putting forward as the lineaments behind my method. What then would my task be as a historian flying forward. Godsuch and Spadaccini refer to the historical activity that they're describing as not far removed from fiction making and concede one has no fewer cognitive goals and ambitions than the other. Questions of how and why they write intertwine in an attempt to weave a representation of something that we do not directly or immediately apprehend but that we experience what, for a lack of a better term, we can only call the changing face of history. And this makeshift, motile face requires a mentality, a worldview, and a form. Godsich and Spadaccini know it, and their solution is incredibly astute. They propose that the historian do prosopopeia, the rhetorical figure that consists in giving a face to that which does not have one. Prosopopeia is a difficult art. It does not seek to achieve closure or finality as narrative does. It does not labor under the rule 
of very similar adequacy as description does. It seeks to represent not that which is absent, but that whose presence is so intense that we can only feel it and not see it from a safe distance. It is a presence that we never doubt, but of which we have no knowledge unless we represent it to ourselves. Forget the two fighting wolves in that Cherokee tale. Our psychopomps are two talking goats that like our historiographies may seem to be opposed, but share aesthetic wiles. The philosopher, drug, remedy, and scapegoat, the therapeutic trinity of the pharmacon, has the thankless task of speaking truth to power to the point of confrontation and potentially self-immolation. The historian is rewarded with the courtesy of clowns and can represent his subject in what's basically a long dance of insinuation. This is where Kissinger nailed it and Seneca failed. The capacity to crawl under the skin of power without cutting is a signature of what I call the Mohini, the sublimated trickster aspect that is not inherently, exclusively, or predominantly destructive, but that has an instinct, sometimes a very great one, for self-preservation. This doesn't mean the prosopon is not a medium when in character, or that he ever breaks it. He will revel in contradictions that inspire the philosopher with caution, because he owns a narrative and has the power to subvert it. He is the Paposilenos in the Bacchic entourage, the panic ringmaster, and all the world's his stage. The philosopher, as we just said, is closer to the pharmacon. The father of his discipline served just this purpose. Socrates looked like a Silenus, but he died as a scapegoat. Theirs is a proud and inauspicious heritage, carried through for generations as with families of executioners or hangmen. During COVID, the philosophers have been busily revisiting their tragic sources, especially in the Girardian framing, so prolifically advanced by Peter Thiel, the prodigal who, understanding mimesis, authority, and mystery, mastered the art of the theater and was able to transcend the stubborn academic samsara of the profession. Moral philosophy, like the Baroque, is an urban phenomenon. Philosopher and polis indissociable. One doesn't move to the city to become an artist or a historian, but a philosopher. And one doesn't move too far from it if one wants to remain one, as even Thoreau knew. With the world upside down and maladaptive as they are to deficits in method and habit, they have also lost a number of their plots. And so we put them side by side. The pharmacon is represented for us by the philosopher. His mode is tragic, his passion is confrontation, his action is submission, his mechanic is sacrifice, his orientation is truth, his other is social, his setting is urban, and his motif, as we will explore later, is proxemics. As to the prosopon, his reenactor is the historian, his mode, the panic, his passion, insinuation, his action, surrender, his mechanic, invasion, his orientation, power, his other, alien, his setting, peripheral, and his motif, masking. As players on the same world stage, prosopoi and pharmacoi share two aesthetic strategies, which often coincide, inversion and estrangement. I did not allot them to the separate schematic charts because, as per the point of this lecture, Aesthetics is the wormhole of all overlaps. I'll demonstrate by adding layers to what follows like a watercolor. Inversion conjures a world the opposite of static, one capable of total reversal in all its components. The complete degloving that we spoke about, unless appropriately delimited through dramatization or ritual, which is what the guided culture of the Baroque was tailored to do. Hyperbaroque does neither. It has cut off its brakes while tearing through the fabric of the fourth wall. The black light to detect it is transvaluation, which I mentioned briefly at the start of the lecture. Let me show an example. The crisis in public policing 
is resulting in the rise of private security. Those who can pay, those who can't are fed to the pigs. While this may be the consequence of attending to a loud, though probably minoritarian public demand, it may be short-sighted in ways the likes of Eric Prince, a 21st century condottiero, may not share. His peculiar class grew unimpeded through revolt, war, famine, and yes, climate crisis, from the Renaissance until its powers were checked with the signing of the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. The United States may soon complement its robber barons and exo-industrialists with a new mercenary class because of the chasm in security and safety that is opening. Those who are safe want security. Those who are not secure in terms of access to the spate of basic rights that should be guaranteed, if not provided by the liberal state, health, housing, freedom of expression or assembly, need safety. Safety is fundamental. Security is sumptuary. The most transparent instance of this playing out before our disbelieving eyes is also plausibly the most grotesque morality play of our time. The sordid tale of Prince Harry and his wife. Security, not titles, is the status signifier they cannot afford to lose. Dumb and crass as they are, even they know their symbolic perpetuity, or what is left of it, depends on this, and possibly on this alone. I wouldn't want the only thing between the mercy of the British taxpayer and myself to be Prince Charles. The other aesthetic technique, prosopoi and pharmacoi share, is estrangement, which we tend to associate with the modern, though it is, like our psychopomps, theatrically eternal. Shlovsky's concept of estrangement, or estranjeni, presents the common in an uncommon light, for the greater glory of the common. Brecht's V effect is trickier, since it is antithetical to the manipulations of Baroque drama, designed to condition a mass culture that was already, much like our own, pre-estranged from itself. It's not impossible, however, to imagine a Brechtian version of Calderón's La Vida es Sueño, in which the Brechtian desire to activate the audience through estrangement is made to dovetail with the Baroque imperative to move. It would be ultimately up to the director to determine how and where to steer that movement, which in either case would lead, by a commodious vicus of recirculation, to Maraval's guided culture of the Baroque. Though it is true that mass culture in the 17th century was not uh, conformed as it is now, its 20th century high and lows are reaching similar degrees of indistinction due to the leveling effects of social media. Especially with the increased demand for social distancing, our everyday thinking is moving from the narratively underwritten to the more immediately and graphically translational, from hieroglyphs to shorthand, the most curious of which may be intersectional identitarianism. While the European Baroque came in the aftermath of the consolidation of the modern subject, the hyper-Baroque introduces a perverse muriology in which people are no longer seen as individuals so much as the sum of their parts, incentivizing group belonging to the detriment of social cohesion. Although the common, absolute, immediate, non-negotiable, unthinking, and unfeeling enemy of our ways of life is the virus. A menace of its scope and magnitude is too inscrutable for many to conceptualize. Crisis consciousness in the hyper-baroque could be presented like the stages of grief, with many people permanently stuck in denial and anger. In the grand arc of the Counter-Reformation, the Baroque became adroit at passive furor, repetition and violence, considering as well of repetition as violence, that as a consequence of the disappearance of every mimetic norm in the Baroque rhetoric, struck its balance in the disproportionate expression of the arts. The catch was to try to impress the public more forcefully 
but also with greater freedom. This was a use of estrangement for guidance, paternalistic, but not uncaring. In the wake of its explosion in mimetic and memetic forms, the hyperbaroque is shaping into a culture of passive to furious aggression. Which is why, having introduced you to the scapegoat, I would like to show you the design of the scapegoat mechanism, evocative of Maraval's resortes, to which translator Terry Cochran devotes a remarkable essay. Of Maraval's four modes of state mediation, medios, animo, recursos, and resortes, the latter is the only to address the question of agency, the mediations provoking an expenditure of activity. Resorte is the psychological expedient and its trigger. Though in the Spanish Baroque state, the resortes, literally the springs, operated on a top-down basis to substitute the static guidance controlling by presence of kings with a dynamic guidance of controlling by activity of their intermediaries, the scapegoat mechanism is the popular inversion of this trope and what sets the Baroque display of simulations and dissimulations into motion. Two important treatises defending the rights of the people to self-determine and overthrow kings, Juan de Mariana's De Regge et Regis Institutione and Francisco Suarez's De Defensio Fide were quickly riffed by the hands of establishment playwrights Lope de Vega with Fuente Ovejuna in 1619 and his successor Pedro Calderón de la Barca's La Vida es Sueño in 1635. The time of the thaumaturge kings, so beautifully studied by the founding martyr of Anal, Mark Bloch, was over and gave way to intimations of scapegoating that would culminate in the execution of Charles I of England in 1649. In our day, this non-representational agency has been taken to never before seen extremes in which these mechanisms are no longer intermediary, but immediate, responsive, and able to learn. This lack of externality may be the core differentiator between Baroque and hyper-Baroque, where Maraval went to great lengths to articulate the mechanism of agency prior to the moment when an action must be thought of as the effect of an agent, that mechanism is now able to articulate itself. Two inhuman entities compete for our attention and condition our behavior, the virus and the algorithm. One has the potential to mutate, the other to rewrite itself. The Baroque's sociopolitical objectives in the use of visual media have now been entirely replaced by social media, an immense accelerating concentrator. If one considers the Baroque was, in some, nothing but a complex of cultural media of a very diverse sort. In any of its variants, recursions, iterations, estrangement is a distancing effect, enacted in our daily lives through socially distanced proxemics and masking, the motifs I allocated to our psychopomps. The transvaluations are, of course, all there. I cannot let you near me because I love you reads almost exactly like, I will not let you near me because I'd kill you, or because you might spell death. Character has never been as thoroughly exposed through masking as it is now, though not in the way civility has made us used to. A number of complex inversions are at work, where to conceal is to protect, and to occlude is to consider. At least stateside, Masks have become dependable political identifiers, reminders of how revelation is the dominant and fundamental Covidian aesthetic. The Covidian is a lavish psychosocial gangrene and amputation, a lethal and global bloodletting that will play out in the reconfigurations it will force on us over the years. It is not a passing crisis or one that is anywhere near ending. If Baroque culture was conservative, aimed at the preservation of the status quo, 
the hyperbaroque is even worse reactionary, desperate to preserve a hollow core. The lifestyles that brought us to this head are already spoken of with a nostalgia once reserved for golden ages. The much touted new normal is an oxymoron. We will be settling for decades. To close, as the art that gives a human face to the animal, the inanimate, and the inhuman, prosopopeia has a reach that falls beyond the ken of the historian to embody, and that is built for the philosopher to come to grief. Quintilian referred to it as able to bring the gods down from heaven, summon the dead, and give voice to cities and states. It is the scope of entities like QAnon or BLM. When we were told Antifa couldn't be declared a terrorist organization because there wasn't an organization to declare, it pointed to this. The American betrayal of the commons represents the catastrophic world historical humiliation of the American idea. The United States is still the great theater of the hyper-Baroque universe, its empire and emporium. The quickness with which the entire country folded around race as shameful origin and founding trauma is itself a sign of American exceptionalism. The unified and all-American resistance to acknowledge the invasive novelty of the alien is by turning inwards to replace it with all American others. And though American race relations are far from universal, their bias has started to percolate elsewhere because like it or not, America still had hegemony over the varieties of social experience. The American way of life and more or less overtly, the American point of view were until very recently the much criticized but also greatly envied and admired imaginal horizon of the peripheral West. The American age of expansion has peaked, and what we're seeing now is its civilizational leeching. Culture is the rebirth of tragedy, and panic its midwife. No one, not kings, not billionaires, not me nor you for that matter, will be exempt from having to play host and hostage to reality. Our reckoning will be impeccable. We have been given the appalling privilege of staring God in the face with only two possible outcomes, death or recollection. No one will remain unmarked, unblemished, unexpelled. It is entirely possible. We owe a goat or two to Asclepius or will when this ends, provided it does. In this sense only, revelation may prove to be singularly democratic.